He's here somewhere. Where is Jonah? All these, uh, these damn kids. <laughs> you, you, you got me out of being a shady person in the woods. Is all the kids <laughs> Getting older is weird in a lot of ways. And one of them is seeing people you've grown up with, close friends you've known your entire life, become actual professionals in the world with authority and prestige, which basically describes my friend Jonah. Jonah has written three books, speaks regularly around the country, and still finds time to see his patients. Okay, we are recording Jonah. So yeah, so you and I have been friends. One of my oldest friends. One of my oldest friends. You've always been, you've always had a, a very sunny disposition. I know that, you know, there are other things afoot, but of course. you've always had a very kind of upbeat perspective. Um, and now you are a psychologist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that the... F I, am a, I am a clinical psychologist. You're a clinical yeah. psychologist and happiness is kind of your domain. Yeah, it's always been something I've been interested in on a personal level. And then when I became a psychologist, I wanted to study the science of happiness. So I spent about the last well, 10 plus years, I'd say, learning about all, all things happiness, writing a few books along the way on happiness and uh, presenting quite a bit and, and doing workshops, lectures, things like that on, on the science of well-being. Okay, so, you know, you live in, you live in, Mer well, you live in the Bay Area. Yeah. <laughs> you live at, <laughs> I live at, let me give my exact address here. Uh, yeah, I live in I live in Marin County. You could say it's uh, in, it's a big county. You live in Marin County. You're not going to get too specific. <laughs> you see people daily. Mm -hmm. What what do you see? There's a lot of struggles. There's you know obviously incredible stress, incredible uh, levels of anxiety, incredible levels of uncertainty. But even if you look at just the broader trends, they're not good. Um, you know, rates of depression have never been higher. Rates of anxiety have never been higher. The, the number of people needing and requesting help has gone up exponentially, and the, the number of therapists has gone up only a trickle. Um, so it's definitely an area that we need more, more hands on deck, we need more help. If there's a through line at all through like the majority of what you see, and it's just like you're on the other side of it, like what, what is the thing you would want to scream at for everyone to know? I think in a nutshell, I mean, probably quite, quite, quite a few things if I was on my soapbox, but. I would say, you know, we tend to think of happiness as this thing that happens to us from the outside in. All right, if I achieve this, if I, uh, you know, accomplish that, that's when I'll be happy. We all do this, like, if-then thing. And we know that that's not really how it works, that uh, only a small portion of our happiness comes from those external sort of factors like, you know, am I succeeding, am I, you know, and, and how much money do I have and all that. So, you know, I think there's a lot of areas that we find ourselves misguided on when it comes to happiness. So awe is an area that I've become really interested in the last few years. It's essentially that feeling that you get in the presence of something that's bigger than you, that's greater than us, that uh, challenges what we thought we knew about the world. Being in a place like this, amongst these incredible redwoods, is a place that for me gives me a lot of awe. But it's a feeling that comes up in all kinds of ways of life. If you, you know, look up at the night sky, or mountain range, you're out of the ocean. But also if you watch a child take their first steps. We can get awe from all kinds of different parts of our experience. Those moments really matter. So it turns out there's this incredible wealth of, of research that's starting to come out to show that the moments that make us go wow actually turn out to be some of the moments that can really change our lives. They test this in all kinds of different ways. So sometimes they'll have people go out to places that evoke a feeling of awe, like you know, visiting the Grand Canyon. Other times they might have people watch a video that brings up a feeling of awe. Sometimes they'll have them watch Cirque du Soleil and be measuring what's happening in their brains as they're watching it. And these powerful experiences of awe have been shown to boost our mood, not just in the moment or an hour later, but even a couple of weeks later. One of the coolest studies to look at awe uh, actually looked at a, a group of people that were struggling with not only overall stress, but even post-traumatic stress. And instead of giving them therapy or medication, how we tend to think of treatment, they did something really unorthodox. They took them on this immersive awe experience. They went to a national park 
They went whitewater rafting. They slept under the stars. And one of the amazing things that happened was not only at the end of that immersive trip did they feel less stressed and even less PTSD symptoms, but even a couple of months later, symptoms of trauma, so PTSD itself, had gone down in these individuals. When we experience these moments of awe, um, areas of the brain that are very much linked with interpersonal connection and the release of oxytocin become very, very active. They light up. Oxytocin, this is that hormone, it's about connection, belonging. It's something that you would get if you're giving somebody a nice hug, holding an infant, petting a furry animal. When we feel this experience of awe, it makes us feel much closer to other people, even if it's a solitary experience. It makes us more altruistic, so people who experience awe become more generous, and it makes us more curious about the world around us. I think probably the place where I felt the most awe was on safari in Africa's national parks. Some of the very things that help us to, you know, survive are some of the very things that make it really hard to be happy. We are not really wired to be content. We're not really wired to be present and mindful. I mean, you could imagine if caveman Jonah walked outside one day and I heard a rustling in the bush over there and I've got two choices in that moment, right? I can either say, oh, that's probably a saber-toothed tiger. Let me get into high alert and go into my fight or flight response. Or I could say, ah, it's probably just the breeze or a squirrel. Let me just appreciate being alive and, and feel good about my life. Now, even if it's that, 99 times out of 100, if there's one time where it is that saber-toothed tiger, I get eaten. And we'd much rather be anxious than dead. Anyone who's made the trip from LA to San Francisco knows how awe-inspiring the journey can be. But I happened to drive up while there was a wildfire burning through much of Northern California. The irony that this was the backdrop of my happiness journey was not lost on me. A really fascinating facet to this research on awe is the fact that when we experience it, um, it leads to this dissolving of the ego. It's actually similar to what some of the research is showing when it comes to certain psychedelic experiences, actually. When we experience it, the default mode network of our brain, which is if we're judging ourselves, self-monitoring in our head, that goes offline. That like literally shuts off when we're experiencing a moment of awe. We're so immersed in that experience. We're so captivated by whatever it is that we're experiencing in that moment that uh, the inner critic quiets. That can be one of the most powerful things about awe is it gives us that shift of perspective. During the pandemic, I started to take up astronomy, just looking at light that's thousands of years old and looking at different planets out there and, and literally you know, different galaxies just puts everything that you're going through today in a different perspective. So however we get in touch with that feeling, I think when we recognize that we are, you know, a small piece of this mysterious, vast, incredible puzzle, but what a gift that we get to be even a small, small part of it. My favorite psychology book, Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl talks about a moment at one of the concentration camps seeing a sunset and for that brief moment in time, describing it as this moment of how lucky to be alive. To be able to be in that circumstance and to say how lucky to be alive is one of the most mind-blowing frames of mind. I can't even wrap my head around that. So what's the... What's the, what's the answer? What's <laughs> what the answer? So, we want to ask ourselves, number one, what gives me that feeling? You know, am I somebody that gravitates towards feeling inspired by people? And that's what gives me a sense of awe. 
Am I somebody that gets it more through nature? Am I somebody that experiences it more through the arts and you know, whatever that might be for us? So getting to know what, what brings that up for us. Uh, number two, I'd say, is we want to stay with that experience. Uh, you know, psychologists would call that mindfulness, but for, the, for us, it's really just about being present and not being in such a rush to move on to the next thing. We also then want to revisit it. You know, there's a fascinating series of studies that have been done in neuroscience to show that when we just think about something, good or bad, it has about 70% the same reactions in our nervous system, in our brain. So whether it's thinking about the things that we're thankful for, thinking about the moments that gave us a sense of awe, remembering those positive moments with people that we love, when we replay and relive those, it has a lot of those same effects. So if I almost think of it like an accordion, where instead of this narrow, minutes-long experience, we stretch it out. We look forward to it, we have excitement, we experience it, we immerse ourselves in that, and then after the fact, we replay it, we relive, we share it, and then you've taken that single positive moment of life and actually turned it into something quite a bit more. What Jonah just said reminded me of something I heard in Denmark from probably the world's happiest man about how Hugo, the Danish super secret to happiness, worked. I'll invite you over for uh, dinner on Friday, and then during the week we'll talk about how quickly Friday is going to be, and then on Friday we'll talk about how quickly this is, and then on Monday we'll talk about how quickly Friday was. There seemed to be a pattern or rhythm to being happy. Looking forward, experiencing, and then reflecting. And this reminded me of something Axel Bouchon, the neuroscientist, kept talking about. It is not only important to live a happy life, but you better remember it. I had never considered that deeply the relationship between happiness and memory. Adding good memories every week, every day to our lives, that is the game of life. Obviously, you can make happy memories, but the idea that recalling them could play such a big role in your overall happiness is something that never really occurred to me. The memory becomes important if you have a recall. Our brain is designed that it gives us back a certain piece of the neurotransmitters we have experienced at the time. Axel has actually developed a way for us to scientifically record and relive our positive memories by translating them into their corresponding neurotransmitters. And what's interesting is that not all positive experiences are equal. It turns out that experiences that trigger oxytocin, cannabinoids, and opioids like awe, community, and gratitude, have the greatest contribution to our happiness. Gratitude seems to be the youngest and therefore most probably most important one in reward systems for the progress of mankind. At some point, it became advantageous for us to be grateful and enjoy moments where our egos melted away. Whatever the reason is, it has to have been in some part a safeguard against us destroying the world we live in a reason for us to come together in peace and enjoy ourselves. I think one of the moments that really jumps out to me was uh, this really uh, interesting day that I think a lot of people will remember. Record high number of people called out sick that day, record high number of marriage proposals, and I'm sounding a little silly, but it was this amazing eclipse. And if you remember that day, you'll remember the feeling that nothing else really mattered. It's getting dark in Manhattan. Wherever you were, if you were at work, you left work for a couple hours. It's still climbing. Wow. If you were, you know, with friends, you all stopped talking to each other and looked up. It's like, just like a little crescent shape right now. And it was this just incredible moment, to me at least, where I'd never seen so many people in one place in silence and in wonder. See it? I see two moons. Beautiful note to end on. <laughs> Thanks, man. I know. Anytime. All right, well, we can walk I'm out. I'm gonna walk out. Now. Look at this. It's amazing. Thank you.